this is the maximum principle. We should focus on the least advantage and try and improve their life chances. Okay? In a sense, you could read Rawls as I do. I think Rawls actually, in a way, was a policy wonk. Because what I think is he was doing a very thick description of the welfare state, basically. It was kind of a justification of the welfare state. And basically what we have is this. This is the Rawlsian deal. If we just imagine a society that's made up of rich people and poor people, okay? There are going to be a few equations today. I promise you, for those who have a little math anxiety or haven't looked at math since they were in high school, not one of them is more complex than that. Okay? Promise. There will be equations, but none more complex than that. I guess you could say that's complex from certain theoretical perspectives, but uh, it's going to be very easy. But we're going to build some really simple models. And if you stick with me, if you stick with me as I build some of these models, you're going to learn a lot. <laughs> I promise. That's the social contract I make with you. Okay? If you stick with me, we're going to learn something together. Okay? So think of a Rawlsian society that's made up of rich people and poor people, basically. Okay? And we're going to say that rich people are basically poor people who get to consume more. That's all. Rich people are poor people, but they get more to consume. The poor people have a social minimum, okay, which is paid for by taxes. Okay? Everybody fine? If you have any questions. And the difference between rich and poor is a measure in economics called the Gini coefficient, a measure of inequality. Okay? It's a measure of inequality. Now, what is Rawls saying? Rawls is saying that when we write the social contract, we basically make a deal between rich and poor. We basically make a, rich, a deal between rich and poor, okay? About how much allowable inequality will exist in our society and where this will be set. Now, why we can't put everyone here, you see, if we put everyone at this level, then we'd be like in the Soviet Union. And, you know, I spent part of my childhood in the Soviet Union. The, favorite, the famous phrase then was, they pretend to pay us, we pretend to work. You know, that's what happens if you set everyone at the same level. So, you know, Rawls and others recognize we've got to give the rich some incentive to work. You know, we've got to give them some incentive. They've got to pay for all this. And that's this amount. So, in a sense, what is the smallest incentive <coughs> that we need to give them? And you can model this in political science like the median voter theorem, right, Steve? Do the median voter theorem, we can model this. In a sense, that's what Asim Aglu and Robinson do. Okay. So, what is the point of this? The important takeaway, what Rawls recognizes, which Bites and Pogi don't, is that this basically exhausts the fiscal base. In other words, let me ask you a question. What percentage of national income does the most generous country on earth give in terms of foreign aid? What percentage of its national income does the most generous country, actually Netherlands, Norway, Sweden are the most generous countries in the world in terms of foreign aid. What percentage of their national income do they give? Anybody have an idea? Just yeah, not very much. Not very much. This is why I want to kind of set the problem for you, the space we're operating in. Can we really change the world completely? Or are we operating in a fairly constrained space? when we talk about how global civil society can operate, okay? And what Rawls is telling us is this domestic bargain basically exhausts the fiscal base. There isn't going to be money for these grand plans that Pogge and Bites put forward, okay? And we see that empirically that the most generous societies on Earth give 1% of GDP, okay? Just to set things in context, today Britain announced, or I guess last week, the nationalization of one bank which has $50 billion in debt. Britain gives about $10 billion in foreign aid. The British people are going to have to absorb $50 billion in bad debt from one local bank. Just to give you a sense of the context. So this is what Rawls recognizes which his followers don't. Is that clear? This is really pretty important to my argument. Because again, I want to create a map of where we are. I want to situate global so civil society for you. Now the other point is a lot of people, I'll bet in Santa Barbara, this is kind of 
or California. People like to talk about ethical trade, fair trade. Fair trade's got to come out of consumption. And studies show that consumers will not pay more than 10% for ethical products. They won't pay more than a 10% premium. So we have a lot of experimental evidence. We give people choices between, you know, like t-shirts made with child labor, not with child labor, all this kind of, you know, unions, not unions, uh, forest products certified not. And people will pay a 10% premium maximum for ethical products. So again, I want to kind of set the stage for this about the space where we can operate. Okay? So what are the implications of the Rawlsian model? They're this. Rawls assumes a world of people. They have their unique social compact. And these compacts set domestic tax policies. Okay? While Rawls himself doesn't define a maximum level of inequality, he, th the other uh, reason why this Rawlsian argument is important is, what do people like Sen say? Sen say we should just set a basic minimum. Ann Kruger at IMF just set a basic minimum for people. Basically, that's what poverty reduction is about. Rawls rejects this. Rawls rejects this approach to development. Forget the social minimum idea. People care about inequality. Okay? They care about inequality. And that's something we'll talk about. So a consequence of the Rawlsian argument is that there's only limited fiscal base to support these transfers, and we see the data. And this means international moral action has to be pretty carefully targeted if it's going to make a difference. Thus, the whole debate over aid effectiveness. Okay? We spend a lot of time. Why am I worried about effectiveness? There ain't much money out there to make a difference. So we have to make it effective. Okay? So here's just ODA. You take a few different, most generous country in the world, least generous country in the world, but we're not talking even 1% of GDP. Okay?